Welcome to the easier way to sell presentation of Close the Deal Without Selling. Here's your host and developer of the easier way to sell, Ike Krieger. Hey, this is Ike Krieger. Welcome back. This episode is filled to the brim with information about personal branding, about a new language for sales, and those are just a couple of the segments in today's podcast, and I have a good feeling that you'll find them very helpful. So if you're in your car or in the comfort of your home or your office, enjoy. Let's take a look at the language that's used when people sell. You know there is a language of selling, and you recognize it immediately. You hear it all the time. When you hear the language of selling, you know you're being sold to, and nobody likes to be sold to. But we're all in sales, and you have to sell to live, so you face a dilemma. How do you sell your product or service with pride and integrity, but with a different set of language tools? Why do you need a new set of language tools? Because people are tired of the old set. Think about it for a moment. Imagine there's a salesman at your front door. Imagine there's a salesman on the telephone or at a place of business you've entered. Think about the conversation, I should say the pitch that you're hearing, and answer this question. Can you tell from their language and the way they say things that they're selling something? How does that language make you feel? You need a new set of language tools. Why? Because if you use the traditional language of selling, which is the wrong language, you'll lose the sale. And even more interestingly, most sales aren't lost at the end of the deal. Most sales are lost at the start of the deal. Most deals are lost by what you say and how you say it. First impressions really do last. Most people will decide about you and whether they're going to do business with you almost immediately. You know this is true because you're as human as the rest of us, and that's how you buy. The easier way to sell is based on a new set of language tools that I call, instead of the language of selling, the language of success. So, get ready to learn and employ this new language. Learn a new language? No! Just stay calm. You'll be familiar with every word of this new language. However, the way the words are applied, the way they're languaged, will be markedly different from the way you currently communicate. The language you use and the way you communicate is what this podcast is all about. And here's the good news. You really won't have to change much. You'll just start to exercise some of your underused language skills, like listening actively and asking open-ended questions. We're well into the podcast now, and if you'd like to get up to speed with this language of success, I invite you to go back and listen to episodes 1 through 10. If you find this information as helpful as I know you will, please go to the website and pick up an accompanying Easier Way to Sell workbook. My friend and former business partner, Andrew Sokol, was on the podcast a few episodes ago, and one of the subjects we touched upon was branding. Andrew and I both agree that the way branding is traditionally taught is backwards. We believe that branding the way that it's taught focuses on a process that's tactical versus strategic. I know tactical versus strategic sounds a bit confusing, but think of it this way. Traditional branding training asks you to look inward at your strengths. You're asked to focus on things that make you better and more memorable than your competition. Well, how do you do that? How do you communicate to your marketplace that you're more memorable and better than your competition? Well, that task seems to be accomplished mostly by creating a flashy logo, a snappy slogan, or a catchy name. 
Now, you make up a website and you decide that it would look great if it were purple or green, and you come up with an idea for a mascot that you love because, well, you really loved your high school mascot. You create your business cards, and these cards are usually beautifully designed with an attempt by you or your graphic designer to make your card as memorable and effective as possible. Think of all the tactical realities you've created in order to show how you're better, how you're more memorable, and why people should do business with you. You gather all of these assets that you've created and then work diligently to combine them all together into your marketing strategy. Your logo, your website, your elevator pitch, everything so that people will remember you and do business with you. This is so backwards. This process is so much less effective than you've been led to believe. Andrew and I came up with the concept of contrary marketing, and contrary marketing reverses this whole process, literally. Now, if you think of performing the marketing and branding process backwards, it makes this explanation much easier. Up until now, the creation of a brand strategy was the last action step of the traditional way a brand is developed. You'll now take that last step as your first step. You'll come up with your marketing and branding strategy first. What is a brand strategy? Well, a brand strategy is the overriding thematic story of the experience someone has when their life intersects with your product or service. A well-developed strategy guides and informs all of your marketing choices. And if I ask you to identify a company from this brand strategy, I bet you have an answer maybe before I complete my sentence. The fun, happy place to have a hamburger meal. I'm, of course, talking about McDonald's. Let's look at their marketing tactics based on their brand strategy. Remember, we're talking about the fun, happy place to have a hamburger. What is their mascot? A clown. What is the name of their child-specific offering? A Happy Meal. Many McDonald's locations feature indoor playgrounds. Now, if you were starting a hamburger franchise, how successful would you be if you decided on a strategy of the fun, happy place to have a hamburger? That brand space is taken. The brand space chosen for my training is another example of owning a certain space in a consumer's mind. The easier way to sell. What is the name of my podcast? Does it fit inside my strategy? Look at the graphics I use. Do they fit inside my strategy? Who else can say they provide the easier way to sell? Switching topics, think of the safest car you know of. I think of a Volvo. Is it the safest car? Studies show that other cars can be safer, yet Volvo owns that branding space. What is your brand strategy? Here's a little story. I spoke with the owner of a picture framing shop in Southern California, and to be honest, the market for picture framing in Southern California is jam-packed. You can find Fast Frame, Easy Frame, The Frame Store, You Frame It, etc., and his shop will call it We Frame It. Andrew and I looked at his company brand and asked how that brand sets him apart from his competition. He told us that he was better and had more experience than any other framers in the city. We suggested that he change his brand strategy to reflect that fact. Here he was, an older man with an Eastern European accent showing through his English. But he said he didn't want to change anything at his store because people knew him and it would be too much trouble to start over again. We clarified that his goal in talking to us was getting more and higher ticket clients. So we came up with a brand strategy where very little would have to change in his operation, but he'd have a better chance of getting more and higher ticket clients. We suggested that he change the name of his shop to Old World Framing. And then I came up with this slogan, We Take Longer and It Shows.
Imagine that you come into possession of an original Picasso, and it needs to be framed. Do you want that framing to go quickly or fast? Or do you want your choice for framing to be caring and meticulous? What if anything would have to be changed in the shop? Aside from different marketing materials or signs that promote the new brand, what would have to be different? Well, the answer is nothing unless you want to make things different. Your brand strategy will guide and inform whatever changes you need to make. Your brand strategy will tell you what your logo should look like. It will help you determine what color scheme should be used on your website. Your brand strategy will help you determine the design of your business cards. Your brand strategy will help you determine everything about the marketing of your business. You can use the brand further to adorn the shop with old world memorabilia, or you could wear an old style apron, anything that would support the strategy. But what would your logo look like? And, re and remember, a logo is not a brand. A logo should represent your brand strategy, but a logo itself is not a brand. If a brand were really a logo, then you'd be in trouble if a competitor had a better looking logo. Branding is a perception. What is your personal brand? What sets you apart from your competitors? Here's a good way to discover what brand strategy is available for you. Research all your competition. Find out what their brand strategy is or if they even have one. And then develop something different. Being better is one thing, but being different is everything. Unless you're different, you'll enter into a dueling brand situation and confuse your marketplace. And you know what happens with a confused marketplace. A confused consumer goes with what they already know. Al Reese and Jack Trout, heroes of both Andrew and myself, wrote the first book to deal with the problems of communicating to a skeptical media blitz public. It's called Positioning the Battle for Your Mind. And in it, they describe a revolutionary approach to creating a position in a prospective customer's mind, a position that reflects the company's own strengths and weaknesses, as well as those of the competitors. Reese and Trout also explain how to make and position an industry leader so that its name and message wheedle its way into the, I love the term wheedle, wheedle its way into the collective subconscious of your market and stays there. They explain how to position a follower so that it can occupy a niche not claimed by the leader. It explains how to avoid letting a second product ride on the coattails of an established one. We'll have Andrew back on the show to give you some more insight regarding brand strategies. But for right now, start looking at your competition. See how they represent themselves as a brand. Your strategy should be simple. You probably know it already. It just hasn't come to the surface. When it arrives, you will find an elegant strategy for your business. Willis Turner, CEO of Sales and Marketing Executives International, was a guest on the podcast recently, and he said the one thing that he would change or make different about the way salespeople function in the world, and he's seen salespeople all over the world, is that they become better at developing their personal brand. Just something to think about. According to the easier way to sell, one of the greatest benefits of taking notes is that it helps you stay organized in your sales exam. In this system, you're being asked to go into your sales interview with nothing but a piece of note paper and a writing utensil. Yeah, you heard me right. Nothing but a piece of note paper, preferably folded in your inside pocket of your jacket or in your purse. Always ask permission to take notes. And upon receiving permission, you will retrieve your single piece of folded paper. Now, here are a couple things you can write down before you go into your meeting. Once you're clear on your outcome, you can write that down on your sheet of paper. If you have a few of your specific open-ended questions you want to ask and you want to make sure you remember them, write them down on your sheet of paper. Remember, ask if it's okay to take notes. Prospects rarely respond with no. 
And of course, you can use your notes as a tool to help remember the main points of the prospect's information and refer to them when needed. Now, there's an accompanying, easier way to sell workbook. And inside of that workbook, there's a mock-up of a note-taking sheet that was created by one of my students. And I think you'll find it most helpful both as a guide and also there's a blank one for you to copy and use all of the time. Remember, take notes, use notes. It's part of the system. And remember what a client of mine from about 25 years ago said. The only thing wrong with Preaker training is that it only works when you use it. Ain't it the truth? We've talked a couple times about pacing and leading. We talked about the transactional analysis model where you move someone either from the parent or the child into the adult or objective conversation. We mentioned how you might get someone to stop doing something annoying by meeting them at their model of the universe and then slowly withdrawing from that activity. An example is someone tapping their foot annoyingly. You start to pace them and tap your foot, slow down, and their foot will also slow down and then stop. Another thing that you need to think about in terms of pacing and leading is voice. And the best example I can give you is when you call someone up and you wake them from a sound sleep. How are they going to respond? Usually they say something like, hello. If you have energy because you just got the job you've been looking for, or you're calling up a friend to tell them you're getting married. If they heard someone screaming or yelling or being very excited on the other end of the phone, my guess is they would hang up. So meet that person at the model of their universe, which is, Hello, and your response should be, hello, didn't mean to wake you up, but I have something very exciting to tell you. May I tell you? They'll respond, yeah, okay. And then you lead with moving up the excitement in your voice to, and this happened, and this happened, and they'll go, oh, how wonderful. You try that at the very beginning, and they will hang up on you. Remember to pace and lead in all areas of your communication. No matter how wonderfully effective you become as a communicator, I need to reinforce the concept that when you've communicated so effectively and so elegantly that no one could possibly misunderstand you, they will. You see, the meaning of your communication is the response that you get. And even though you think that what you say means what you think it means, it really doesn't. Your communication means what the other person thinks it means. Our job is to find out what they think our communication means. And for that, you have the choice of even saying, I want to be clear when I said that to you, what did you think I meant? Here's a story about an immigration attorney here in the United States. The attorney is concerned because he isn't getting the right kind of clients. He's having a hard time building a thriving business. What do you think his challenge is? First, let's consider his marketplace, his clients. Who are they? What is their issue? What does he do for them? Again, think to yourself, what do the words immigration attorney mean to you? Here's a possible answer. An immigration attorney helps people retain their citizenship or get their citizenship or stop deportation. Who are his clients? The response to that question given most often, his clients are undocumented immigrants or people who need student visas or green cards. But the real answer is none of these. Those answers don't even come close to describing what this immigration attorney does. He works as a freelance corporate immigration attorney and sets up all the paperwork for companies or executives that are relocating to the United States. This paperwork allows the company executives to begin work immediately and smoothly upon arrival in the United States. 
This would not be how most people would describe his service. This is not the job description that most people would assign to the term immigration attorney. This was the main reason for his lack of marketing effectiveness. People really didn't know what he did based on the term he used. The term immigration attorney meant what others thought it meant, not what this individual attorney hoped it meant to them. Here's an exercise I do on speaking engagements, and the audience finds it a real hoot. Now, hoot is a technical term, by the way. A psychologist friend of mine named Gregory was attending a convention in Boston, and he was sitting in an auditorium filled with about 500 people. The facilitator got up in front of the group and said, we're going to do an exercise. I'm going to say a word, and then I want each of you to write down the first five words that come to mind. And then we're going to go around and see who among you comes up with the same words or answers. His instruction to the crowd was to take out their business card and on the back of it draw a circle with five small arrows coming out of it. He asked them to write down the word he was going to give them in the circle and then fill in the first five words that came to mind when they heard that word. He then said the word stand, S-T-A-N-D. He also said that the first word most people think of is sit. He told them that the use of the word sit was perfectly okay, but since he was the one who brought it up, that they might want to go ahead and use some others. He told them that they'll get 60 to 90 seconds to complete the exercise, and then they'd finish it up. But before I tell you what happened next, a short story is in order. My friend Gregory had gone out to see a movie the evening before, and that film was called The Hot Rock, and it starred Robert Redford. The plot calls for Redford to give a hypnotic suggestion to an elevator operator in order to facilitate the theft of a fabulous diamond. The post-hypnotic suggestion was triggered by the words, Afghanistan, banana stand. Afghanistan, banana stand. Okay, we're now back in the hall with Gregory. The facilitator is continuing the exercise. And now the facilitator asks the people to read their list of words. He tells them that if a word has been used, it's to be crossed off everyone's list, and nobody has to bring it up again. Who was called on first? Well, Gregory, of course. He was asked to read the list of five words that he came up with. The first word that came to mind when Gregory heard the term stand was banana. How many of the other 500 people in the room do you believe had written down the word banana? Out of a room of 500 people, no one else came up with the same word. Everyone laughed. Gregory gave his next word, and out of the 500, only 10 to 15 people had that word listed. Then he went to his third word, and interestingly, no one in the room had that word either. Then Gregory said the word sit, and a bunch of people had that word. And finally, the facilitator moved on to the next person. Others found it interesting that few in the room had any of the words that were listed by the second person. The exercise continued through two or three complete rows before the participants ran out of fresh words. One of the most often heard responses to a miscommunication is, but I thought you meant. This exercise proves that. Remember, the meaning of your communication is the response you get. You think that what you say means what you think it means. That's not accurate. What you say means what other people think it means. And just when you've communicated so perfectly that no one could possibly misunderstand you, they will misunderstand you. Studies show that the spoken word is the least effective communications device known to man. It's truly amazing that we communicate it all. Well, that'll do it for this episode. I want to remind you to follow us on LinkedIn and on Facebook at Close the Deal Without Selling. You'll get additional information that'll help you in your quest to learn the easier way to sell. Think about the branding that we talked about and ask yourself, what is my personal brand? 
How is it different than my competitors? Or am I just saying the same thing that they are in a different way? Just remember that being better is one thing and being different is everything. This is Ike Krieger. See you next time.